There we go. All right. Good morning and welcome. So, yeah. So we are going to get into our study of uh, laying on of hands that we kind of referenced last week a couple times. And so this was a homework assignment I'd given a couple of weeks ago, and I know a couple of you actually worked on it and had that. If you didn't do that, um, this is what we were covering. Yeah, we're going to cover this today. So kind of the last of the topics for this series. And uh, next week um, we will get into a new topic, basically talking about the church a little bit more. So. Before we get into this, let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, you've been kind and good to us in so many ways. We're grateful for this day that we can come and we can study your word. We can worship you in spirit and truth. We can be encouraged and built up and uplifted. And we pray, Father, that all that uh, you provide for us be used wisely, be used honestly, be used in a way that brings honor and glory to you, that helps others to see your love and mercy in this world, that you use everything you've given us uh, to, to your benefit. And Father, uh, may we continue to, to reach out, to encourage others, to build one another up. May the study today help us to be reminded of you and your ways, and we'd follow them always. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk. Uh, um, I think, yeah, there's some pens right there. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so we're going to talk about the laying on of hands. Last week when we were talking about baptism, we notice the fact that two or three times that that topic came up. And so today we want to talk about that a little bit, okay? So just a quick way of introduction, uh, much of this study has been coming from Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2, well, verse 1 and 2 in particular. So I want to read those, chapter 6, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Yeah, it says, Therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death, and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. So This has been kind of the focus for our study for the last couple of months. We've looked at how some of these things kind of fit together in pairs, that we had looked at the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. We had looked at those, and they had some distinct passages about those, those two things kind of fit together. And then last week we had looked at baptism, last two weeks we had looked at baptism, last week in particular about believer's baptism, and then also we noticed in, the, in going through that that it referenced this idea of laying on of hands, and so we see that here in the text, this laying on of hands, which is what we want to talk about today, okay? And we see it included with these other, when we talk about foundational things about Christianity, I mean, people, yeah, the resurrection, and we talk about the faith in Christ, we talk about baptism, we talk about judgment, but laying on of hands? How does that fit in? Why, why do you suppose this is here? It's an object lesson, I think, because if, when they're doing, when the apostles were laying hands on the certain people, okay. getting, you know, the Holy Spirit all of a sudden okay. comes out, then showed everybody else that they had this power, but also it was an object lesson. I remember when I became a deacon over in uh, at Lakeview years ago, they, they, they put a few of us in and so they laid their hands on us. Okay. And everybody saw that, so they okay. knew who the deacons were, and then they okay. did for elders as well. Okay, all right. Same thing. Okay, so an object lesson, we see that, and we'll get into that. We'll see how it was used in the New Testament and how we might use that today. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, a formal recognition, a conveyance of authority. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it's in here, and there's, there's a reason for it, um, but it may not be as obvious to us as some of these other things, and so we want to take a look at that. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, other, these other doctrines we've looked at, they've got texts that have expounded the commands or examples or the explanations. I mean, like last week we looked at baptism, there were a whole bunch of examples on that. We looked at like the resurrection, there was a big chunk of passage in 1 Corinthians 15, and also when we looked at like the um, judgment, there was a good passage there in Romans chapter 2. But when we get to this one, it's like, hmm, there's just scattered little mentions of it. There's not really a lot of detail about it, right? So, um, yeah, so it's a little bit distinctive in that regard. Um, yeah, so when we come to the laying on of hands, we don't see, and, and that was part of the assignment was to go and look and see, okay, what text do we have about it? You know, who was laying hands on who and why, okay? Um, 
one of the things I think to keep in mind is when we look at the book of Hebrews, that it is primarily geared towards people who are, have a Jewish background, Jewish Christians primarily. And the Jews would have had a, definitely a familiarity with laying on of hands, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And so this could be partly, you know, for them in particular and how it relates to the Christian faith. So this is something to kind of keep in mind, all right? So just as that is kind of a, a background then, okay? Um, if we look at verses that talk about this idea of laying on of hands, and there's a couple different ways you can look at it. Um, you know, some people may, you know, come up and say, wait till I get my hands on it, right? You know, for something they've done, you know, but I don't think that's quite the idea here, right? You know, somebody's wanting to choke somebody to death because they did them wrong or something. Um, but that's not really the idea that uh, the Bible has when it says this laying on of hands. But when we look through the Old Testament, um, I came up with about 21 verses in the Old Testament and about 28 in the New Testament that have this idea of laying on of hands. Now, there's many other verses that have the idea of hands, but they don't put them with the laying on of hands. Okay. So, yeah. Now, if we just spent even one minute just reading this verse and talking about it, that's going to be 49 minutes. We'd use up the entire class time. Um, and I don't want to spend all our time doing that, so we'll end up kind of condensing some of these things together to get the key concepts. This is probably going to be, in this class, probably one of the most in-depth studies we're going to do in terms of looking at verse and trying to put things together. Um, but it is part of our study, so we want to spend some time on that. Okay. In the Old Testament, I want to look at, now how many people went through and looked at the Old Testament passages? Anybody? Yeah, because Keith, I know you gave me a really nice uh, uh, section on the New Testament passages. Really good, okay? Um, and as I mentioned already, that this book of Hebrews is written to, primarily to Jewish Christians who would have been familiar with the Old Testament stuff. So I want to look at the Old Testament and how it's used there um, in terms of laying on hands before we get into the New Testament as well. So let's turn back to Genesis. Uh, this is one of the very first references we find to this. Genesis chapter 48, verse 14. This is near the end of the book. Um, at this point, um, the Israelites, what few there are, are down in Egypt. And uh, Jacob, uh, also known as Israel, uh, the father of the Hebrews, he's got his 12 sons, and now he's got grandsons and great-grandsons. He's getting ready to die. And he's been blessing his sons. And we read in chapter 48 and verse 14, uh, let's actually back up to verse 12. So um, then Joseph, Joseph is the, next the youngest son of Jacob. When Joseph removed them from Israel's knees, this is um, his children, bowed down with his face to the ground, Joseph took both them, Ephraim on his right, towards Israel's left hand, Manasseh on his left, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, although he was younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys, may they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. Um, so here we see that he's putting his hands on his two grandsons, but he crossed his arms. Um, because he actually was giving the larger blessing to the younger one, right? Normally the firstborn got the major blessing. And Israel was purposely crossing his arms, um, partly because Jacob was a secondborn, but he got the blessing. So he's passing this along to his grandson. But the idea here, what we see is this idea they laid his hands on and he's pronouncing a blessing, okay? So this is one occasion where we see this laying on of hands. They're doing a blessing. And we'll see that in the New Testament as well, all right? Um, the other thing that we see uh, uh, quite a bit of in the Old Testament is the hands being laid on for offerings. And when I started doing this studying, I was aware of that the priests would do this, but I found that it wasn't just the priests that did this. So let's take a look. Exodus chapter 29, so it's the next book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 29 And verse 10 in particular. 
And we're going to read several of these verses. We're going to see that it's, it's um, definitely that Aaron, who is the high priest, uh, his sons, but there's other people that lay hands on as well. So let's look at Exodus chapter 29, verse 10. Um, so in most of these passages here, it is God is giving directions to Moses, and Moses is conveying these commands to the people about what is to be done in terms of how they're supposed to be worship, how the offerings are supposed to be made, all these different laws. And he says here in chapter 29, verse 10, Bring the bull to the front of the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on its head, slaughter it in the Lord's presence at the entrance of the tent of meeting, take some of the blood's bull and put on the horns of the altar with your finger, and pour out the rest at the base of the altar. Okay, So they've got this bull that's going to be sacrificed as, as an offering, and Aaron and his sons are to place their hands on it, Okay, lay hands on it, and then they are to slaughter it and, and dump out the blood. Okay, So we see this as an example. And then if we turn over just a few more pages, the book of Leviticus, the ne next book in our Bible, and Leviticus largely conveys the things that were told to Levi, who was a son of... Um, or is one of the 12 uh, tribes there to, to be the priests. And let's read in verse 3, starting in verse 3 of chapter 1. If the offering is a burnt offering, um, let's start in verse 1. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him at, from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any of you, any of you bring an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. He is to lay his hand on its head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So here it's not just the priest, but it's anybody who comes before him to offer him, right? So anyone comes up, they're making an offering, they were to lay their hands on him and it was to make atonement for their sins, okay? So it wasn't just Aaron. Um, and we... Continue on in chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2. It says, If someone's offering is a fellowship offering and he offers an animal from the herd, whether male or female, he is to present it before the Lord, an animal without defect. He is to lay his hand on his head, on the head of his offering, and slaughter it at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Then Aaron and his son shall sprinkle the blood against the altar and all the sides. Okay, So here's a fellowship offering. And again, we see the people putting their hands on the offering. Okay. Kind of interesting. Okay, And also in that same chapter down to verse um, 6 and following, if he offers an animal from the flock as a fellowship offering to the Lord, he is to offer a male or female without defect. If he offers a lamb, he is presented before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of, the, of his offering and slaughter in the front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. So again, the idea that they are um, to lay their hands on it before they slaughter the animal for an offering. Okay, um, We also see in chapter, the same chapter down in verse 12 and 13, if he's offering a goat, he is to present it before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it in the front of ten of meeting. Then Aaron shall, and his son shall sprinkle his blood against the altar on all sides. So it didn't matter whether it was a goat or um, a sheep or a, a cow, um, the steer, basically it was to be uh, lay their hands on it, okay? And in chapter 4, just the next chapter over, verse 15, this one says, the elders of the community are to lay their hands on the bull's head before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord. Then the anointed priest to take some of the blood's bull into the tent of meeting, he'll dip his finger in the blood, sprinkle it before the Lord seven times in front of the curtain. Okay? So here is a Another time, so the elders put their hands on it, okay? And this is in connection, if we read verse 13, if the whole Israelite community sins unintentionally, does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's command, even though the community is unaware of the matter, they are guilty. When they become aware of the sin they committed, the assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering, present it before the tenth meeting, and then the elders of the community lay their hands on it. So here's a community sacrifice. So over and over again, we see this idea that there's an offering a, of an offering being made before God that's going to be slaughtered and, and killed, and people are laying their hands on it. So whether it be the priests and Aaron or the people, they were doing it, yeah. Which is something I hadn't thought much about. Um, so I normally thought about the priests doing all this, but the people were doing it, okay? So, 
kind of interesting. Um, and we also we see an example of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Uh, one of the things that I found was that outside of the first five books, there's almost no mention on the laying of hands. So most of what we're reading here are things that God told the Israelites when he's giving them the law. And we do see an example uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, Hezekiah, who was king of Israel or of Judah at this time, uh, was a good king trying to make sure they're following the law. And in chapter 29 and verse 23, um, actually we'll read verse 22, let's see. So they slaughtered the bulls and the priest took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar next to the slaughtered, next they slaughtered the rams and sprinkled their blood on the altar. Then they slaughtered the lambs and sprinkled their blood on the altar. The goats for the sin offering were brought before the king and the assembly and they laid their hands on them. Okay. Then the priest slaughtered the goats, presented their blood on the altar for a sin offering to atone for all Israel because the king had ordered the burnt offering, sin offering for all of Israel. So we see that they were trying to carry this out. Okay. All right. We also see this same kind of sin offering in Leviticus chapter 16. Go back to the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus chapter 16 talks about what's called the Day of Atonement. This was a special day, one day a year, where the priests were to make atonement for all the people's sins. And in this case, they are to bring forth um, two um, goats. And in chapter 16 and verse 21, uh, we'll read verse 20 and following. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he is to bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert on, in the care of the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert, okay? So here we see, and Keith mentioned early on about this idea of conferring something, you know, transferring something. Here we see, yeah, the sins, the sins of the people are being transferred to this goat and the goat being sent out of the assembly, okay? So, yeah. Um, think about Christ coming, exactly. I mean, a lot of what's in this Old Testament and the laws that God gave were designed, and that's what the book of Hebrews points out, is that Christ is fulfilling all this Old Testament prophecy, but he's also better than the Old Testament sacrifices. But these sacrifices had a point and a purpose, right? It was pointing him to Jesus, but the sins had to be dealt with. And he dealt with it by this laying on of hands, you know, by the people, by the priests, and on the goat or these animals that were slaughtered for their sake, just as Christ took on our sins, right? So yeah, so we see this as another purpose. So the first one we see is this idea of they were conferring a blessing. So again, transfer a blessing. Here we see this kind of transfer of sins into the people, okay? Um, but we also see another type of transfer, another laying on of hands in the book of Numbers. So we're in Leviticus. The next book is Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, we can read all sorts of different names. They list all the different people and who's related to who and so forth. And in Numbers chapter 8, here we find uh, Numbers chapter 8, verse 10. Let's read verse 9 and following. Bring the Levites to the front of the tent of meeting and assemble the whole Israelite community. So we've been reading about the front of the tent of, uh, tent of meeting. That's where they bring their offerings. Here, they're bringing the Levites there. You are to bring the Levites before the Lord, and the Israelites are to lay their hands on them. Is going to kill them? A lot of Israelites, I know a lot of people, and lay a hand on them, yeah. So um, Aaron is to present the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the Israelites so they may be ready to do the work of the Lord, okay? So they're not going to kill them, right, like they have the sin offering. But it is it's considered, a, what it says here is a wave offering. They're com being commissioned for the work of the Lord, okay? So again, we have this laying on of hands that they are commissioning. These people are going to be our priests. They're going to do... Uh, bring our sacrifice before the Lord, okay? So there's this idea of laying on of hands there too, okay? Commissioning them for this work, all right? And we, and we see this same type of commissioning, if you will, still in the book of Numbers, if we go to chapter 27. 
excuse me, chapter 27, verses 18 through 23. Um, at this point, Moses is getting old, and Joshua, who's been with uh, Moses, is going to take over for him. And we can read in Numbers 27, verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urman, Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Okay, so here's another example, kind of like we just read there in Numbers 8. Moses will lay his hands on Joshua and basically commissioning him and giving him some of the power that he had, uh, that he was going to be the leader. Okay, so we see this um, example. And we see in the next book, Deuteronomy, in chapter 34, basically this is the last chapter in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9, and we see this kind of a fulfillment of what had just we just read about. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. So we see that that authority had been transferred to uh, Joshua and uh, filled with wisdom, and uh, the people obeyed him. So there was this conference, if you will. Okay? Yeah. Now there's one other reference that is kind of, maybe out of character with these, but, um, but we do find it in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 139 and verse 5. This is a psalm of David. Let me just read the first five verses here. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before You've laid your hand upon me. Does anybody have other different wording there for verse um, 5 there? You laid your hand upon me. You hem yeah. me in. Hem me in, in. yeah, okay. That's yeah. The yeah, and if you read verse 6 and 7 following, you'll kind of get a better idea here. He says, um, you, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. You know, the idea is God's presence is there no matter where he goes. Okay? It, it's almost used more metaphorically, if you will, but we see this idea of, of hands. But, yeah, kind of God's presence is there. Okay? Yeah. It's kind of a nice comforting thought. God's with us no matter where we go. We can't get away from him, yeah. So <laughs> in one respect, it should be comforting uh, if we believe in God, if we're, if we're following him exactly. Okay. So given all these we've just read, how would you summarize the use, the laying on of hands? Now think about you're a first century uh, Jew, and you know this Old Testament kind of stuff. How would you summarize the use of, of laying on of hands then? How would... What was the significance and what was the message of laying on of hands? Why was it used? You're agreeing to the sin that's been caused, so you're, you're putting yourself out there, and um, that way that sin is being taken away from you, because if they didn't, then you're not agreeing to uh, what the cause was. Uh, okay. If it's a blessing, then you're agreeing to that blessing. If the whole congregation is putting their hands on this one individual saying, bless you in your way to go, then you're agreeing to that and, okay. and uh, you know, being a part of it. Okay. In one sense, an agreement with what is going on, what is being done, the placing of sins on the sacrifice or of the person or persons who are going to be leading. Okay. And it's showing the rest of the people of Israel, especially Joshua, you know, you're talking about Joshua, how um, Moses laid his hands on him and mm -hmm. all this, you know, they all saw that. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this visual representation before the people. This is what's going on and what's taking place. Okay, Keith? Uh, a formal recognition of the moment. Okay. Okay, kind of a formal recognition of the moment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, and, and particularly with all the sacrifice and the other ones, I mean, these are all being done at God's command. God is the one who's directing these things, and they're following God's commands and agreeing with what God is doing. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. 
Yeah, so the, the first century Jews would be aware of this idea of laying on of hands as conferring a blessing, conferring, conferring you know, authority, or conferring the sins um, onto these offerings, okay? Now we come to the New Testament, okay? Let's look at Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, now again, and, and again, remember what we just thought, saw and we were just looking at, okay, in the different verses. Um, and in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, and this is repeated in Mark and Luke, we don't need to read all three accounts. Uh, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. And I think the other ones will talk about he prayed for them or he blessed them as well. Yeah, okay. Um, kind of interesting. You know, so where do you suppose the Jews got the idea they should bring their children to Jesus to put his hands on them? Past? You know, you know particularly like when um, um, Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. You know, kind of that idea, you know, the blessing there. Yeah, so, but kind of interesting, yeah, that they had Jesus, they wanted Jesus to place his hands on him. Here's a prophet, uh, one of them to bless him. Plus, okay. you made that point that, uh, you know, for such uh, belongs the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to like, people yeah, like this, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, um, I was trying to remember if the other, very much so, yeah, I think there's more than one occasion where he talks that, about that, yeah. Um, yeah, in the Mark passage, Mark uh, ten sixteen, might say he took the children in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. Yeah, I mean, you see him kind of, you know, wrapping the ch children in his arms, you know, and blessing them. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, so this is, uh, you know. A, it would have been, been interesting to watch that. Yeah. He took his so, cloak and put it around the, Yeah, the group that you know, because, I mean, you can think about it. I mean, this one talks about he puts his arms around and puts his hands on him. But you can also, there's another passage later where Jesus says, I wish I could gather you like a hen gathers his chicks, you know, but it, the protection, you know. Yeah, exactly. So uh, interesting little piece that we have here in the laying on of hands, okay. Um, we also see on several occasions where Jesus laid hands on people and healed them. Mark chapter, while well, we're in Mark, or I'm in Mark anyway, but you may not be. Um, I flipped over there. Mark chapter 6 and verse 5. Um, we'll read verse 4 and 5. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, in his house, as a prophet without honor, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. So here we have a very definitive one. He's saying he laid their hands, hands on them and healed a few sick people. Didn't do many other miracles. Um, in chapter 8 of Mark, we see another occasion. Verse 22 and 23. Then they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Then he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Okay. So here we see him putting his hands on him. Um, he also spits in his eyes. I mean, that would be that pretty disgusting to our way of thinking. Never seen that one? Yeah. I've never seen one says they look, they look like trees walking. Look like trees walking, I've yeah. I've never heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like he had partial sight. It wasn't quite clear. Um, and then he puts his hands on his eyes. Yeah. There was a slow situation there. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, so most of the time, I've read that yeah. before. Yeah. You know what? You would spit in his eye. Right. And what do you see? Yeah. You know? well, why didn't that just. Why didn't he. There's, why there's a reason. Why didn't he. Yeah. Quite, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't Probably go into that. It's weird. I've heard every. Never seen that one. Yeah, it's amazing. That's that's why we tell people to read it because every time you go through, you might pick up some, something you never you saw before. Do. Yeah, you know. I mean, it's just like the t the laying on of hands, the Old Testament. I didn't had thought about the people laying their hands yeah, on it. Thought, yeah. yeah, you always think about the priest doing that, but it talks about the people and the elders as well. So yeah, we learn something every time we go through it, which is kind of cool, right? Okay. 
but yeah, that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, why why he ended up doing it twice? But he talks about he lays his hands on him, he touches his eyes after spitting on him, and it's clear. So, well, that you know, maybe there could have been um, some there. Um, How would he have spit in his eyes? <laughs> yeah, I know that. It just you know, yeah. Must, so, yeah, something. something yeah. Yeah, that's right. Then he touched his eyes. Yeah, and then he could see clearly. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, if someone spit yeah. in your eyes, you might take a while to be able. To it see it see. might take a while for that I to mean, clear. Yes. Yeah. yeah so exactly. So yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. It it is interesting. Yeah. So, um, and if we go over to the book of Luke. Um, in chapter 4, and down to verse 40, uh, Jesus just got done. Actually, re let's read 38 through 40 um, here, because I want to see kind of a contrast. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once, began to wait on them. When the sun was setting... The people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, the demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. Okay? Yeah. So we, we see in here that he is healing all sorts of sicknesses, placing his hands on them, and yet there's a couple other parts where he heals the fever, doesn't talk about laying on hands, and talks about demons coming out and doesn't necessarily mention laying on of hands. The point I want to make is that there's clearly times when Jesus laid his hands on people and clearly healed and put his hands on and healed them. But there's clearly other times when he performed a miracle and healed people and didn't put his hands on them. Or the people that went up to and touched them with that one lady that Well, had yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, we have the one lady who comes up to him and says, if I just touch the hum in his garment, I'll be healed. And she was. And Jesus faith. didn't do anything. Yeah, it was faith. And at the same time, we had like the centurion who said, just say the word. Don't even come to my house. Just say the word and I know I'll be healed. Yes. And so Jesus healed from a distance. Didn't go anywhere near him. So it's clear Jesus could heal without laying on hands. But it's also clear you that he... Say it, yeah, I mean, but it's also clear that there are several times when he used his hands and laid upon people and healed them. Yeah. So was it kind of like based on the level of faith kind of in a sense? Like whoever, whoever was like how they were, that's how Jesus would kind of approach them with his, like, power of healing. Whatever. Yeah, you wonder. Because there were some people that clearly, when he healed them, they clearly had great faith, and they were mm -hmm. healed. And there's yeah. other people, it's like, you don't know if they had any faith at all. I mean, the first, again, think about Jerry's daughter who died, was 12 years old. Did she even know who Jesus was? Now, she might have, but Jesus brought him, him her back from the dead, whether she had faith, but Jerry's did. Keith, you were going to say something? Or? Part of it has to do with... Uh, the people that are sick. I mean, if they have a disease, yeah. a lot of people don't want to touch them or be near them. Yeah. And yeah. he's just going out and saying, you know, and it bringing another aspect to them, like, he lo loves yes. me enough that he even put hands on me to, yes. to heal me. It shows yeah. his compassion. Yeah, you know? it shows his compassion. I mean, just like with the children, right? He was willing to reach out, put his arms around them, and bless them and stuff, yeah. Jesus touched the leper. Yes. Yeah, he did. Yes. He be healed. Yeah, he touched the leper, and I don't think I've got that one in here. But yeah, a leper, because you weren't supposed to touch a leper. No. I mean, they were definitely unclean, yeah. and yet Jesus reached out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that Jesus was showing in several different ways that he had compassion for all these people, whether they were sinner or sick or whatever. Um, so we see this, yeah. You might keep in mind, too, as Keith was saying, the people rejected them. You yes. didn't get near anybody with those right. diseases. Yeah. Yeah. If Jesus touches them, then they can see that it's okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. Getting back to, yeah, G, you know, Jesus is reaching out and touching these people. They're okay. And yeah, yeah. The Son of God is reaching out. These people are okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's pretty, pretty easy. He did. He healed many of them. Yes. Yeah, that would signify acceptance. Yeah. yeah. Signifying the acceptance. Yeah. Yeah, I should have looked up the one with the uh, the leper. Yeah, he did tell the leper that one leper to go to the priest. And he did. Yes. Yeah. There were, there's more than one occasion of healing a leper. On um, one occasion, he had like ten. He sent them to go see the priest, and what one or two came back to say thank you. Yes. Yeah, there was a Samaritan. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. And in chapter 13 of Luke, 
we also see, uh, after 13, verses 10 through 13. Okay, oh, this is the one. Yeah, this is the one that you were just referring to, Cameron, that, uh, yeah. Um, on the Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching one of the synagogues, and a woman who had been who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years, she was bent over, could not straighten, oh, that's different, okay, could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his, hand, his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so some... So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Um, yeah. Uh, but Jesus was saying, well, you hypocrites, verse 15, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, humiliated but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. And it kind of gets back to what we were just talking about, the idea that what Jesus was kind of showing acceptance. And here he's healing on the Sabbath and saying, yeah, God wants people, you know, uh, yeah, uh, free from their infirmities, uh, whether Sabbath or not. But it's another occasion where he reaches out um, and touches the woman. So we see this, and there, there are, are other examples. We're not trying to go through every one. But we see this um, on many occasions that Jesus is reaching out and puts his hands on them and healing people. Yeah, pretty powerful, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, we also see in the New Testament that this was predicted that Christians would do this, or at least some would. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 18, we'd read this verse last week when we were talking about um, baptism. Um, verse 16 and following, it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they'll drive out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all, and they'll place their hands on sick people, and they'll get well. So a number of different miracles they were going to be able to do, including being able to lay their hands on people and make them well. Okay? And in Acts chapter 5, then, we've been, we looked at Acts last week several times for baptism, how it was carried out. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12 um, my, my NIV version does not use the word hands, but I think other versions may. It says, The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Does anybody have a verse, version that has the word hands in there, Keith? It's at the hands of the apostles. At the hands of the apostles, yeah. Okay. So you by get the, the idea. Hand, by, by the hands of the apostles. Okay. So you get the idea of the apostles who had the Holy Spirit come on them, that, you know, baptized in the Holy Spirit, they had that power. To heal people, okay? And so they were doing that, all right? Um, we also do see in Acts chapter 9 and verse 17, this was the conversion of Saul we looked at last week as well, um, that Ananias had been called to go to Saul's house and to tell him what God wanted him to do. And in verse um, 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul the, Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scale fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking his food, he regained his strength. Okay? So it appears that Ananias put his hands on him, and then Paul got his sight back. Okay? Now... Now, where Ananias got that power, it doesn't tell us here, but I think there's other verses that would indicate where that power may have come from, okay? So, one of the things we see is we see clearly the apostles had this power, but we also see that they had the power to give the power to someone else, that they could, you know, do this. In Acts chapter 8, uh, just backing up one chapter, eight, chapter 8, of verse 9, 17 through 19, we looked at this one last week as well about Simon being baptized in verse 13, where it says, Simon himself believed was baptized. He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And then dropping down to verse 17, um, well, actually, we should read verse 14 and following. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was trouble. Yeah, Peter said, hey, you got the wrong idea here. Yeah, you got the wrong idea. Um, but it's very clear that the apostles had that ability to put their hands on people and confer that power of the Holy Spirit upon them. And those people then could do miracles. And that's very likely what happened with Ananias. He may have been in contact with the apostles, had that power, um, as many people in that New Testament did. Um, this is an example here. They had been baptized. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They had the indwelling, but they didn't have the gifts, the miraculous gifts. And Peter and John went there and placed their hands on them. They could do that. Okay? Um, we also see in ni chapter 19 in verse 6, another passage we read last week in connection with baptism, where the people there in um, Ephesus had received John's baptism. And Paul was you know, explaining to him a bit more about the Holy Spirit and about the baptism of Jesus, and reading in verse 4 and following, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there are about 12 in all. So again, we see an example. The apostle placed his hands on somebody then they have this miraculous ability to be able to speak in tongues. Okay. Um, one more quick one in chapter 28 in verse 8. Um, this is, um, again, Paul, and they're on the shore of this island, Malta. And it says, uh, verse 7, there was an entire an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery, Paul went to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. Okay, So another example of hands being placed and healing people. All right, we're kind of running out of time, um, but I want to read 2 Timothy 1.6, and we'll bring this up next week and try and draw this to a conclusion. But I'll leave you with this in 2 Timothy 1.6. Okay. Because we have seen that the apostles had both the ability to heal but they also have the ability to place their hands and confer um, gifts on someone. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul's writing to Timothy here. says, For this reason I'm reminded, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is, through, uh, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Okay? So some sort of gift was given to Timothy through laying on of his hands. And we'll pick that up next week and um, conclude this idea of laying on of hands. So be thinking about, if you haven't done the assignment, thinking about if there's other occasions of laying on of hands and what the significance is for us today. Okay, and we'll wrap this up next week. All right, let's, yeah. Yeah, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we again come to you knowing you are perfect in all your ways and that you have shown us uh, how you want us to conduct ourselves as your children. We're thankful for your word, the idea of this laying on of hands and the conferring of authority, abilities, and of your uh, blessings. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand this, that we might uh, use it properly and be reminded that your hand is always upon us, that you are there with us no matter where we go, and we can be comforted by that fact. May we take you and your word wherever we go and share it with those around us. They, too, might know of the salvation to your son, Jesus. All these things we ask and we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.